Hey y'all, welcome. Welcome back to Inner Stage Window, my Saturday stream. And oh my God, we have a podcast episode today, don't we, Landon? We do. Oh, back oh again. God. Back again <laughs> with them vampires. That's right. Hello, Lunar. Hello. I see you with Hi. the first today. I think it's very appropriate that our werewolf friend Lunar is here with the first when we are talking about New Moon. <laughs> the home the home of the werewolves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. what brought them back into into any sort of popularity was i do truly <gasps> believe this rendition of <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i can't really fully disagree you know what i mean because it's kind of like oh um people were able to read twilight and be like well vampires are annoying but i love werewolves and um you know i mean twilight started a whole vampire werewolf era uh let's be real <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally this is something we didn't talk about but it like connected I said a thing that I felt was like bullshit but then I was like there might be real and werewolf romance novels is a huge subgenre of like of romance novels and I'm wondering if it gained popularity because of the mommy obsession with Jacob oh my gosh I would love it to see some meta analysis of that you know what I mean I think that would be really cool I like I Twilight am... just for the wolves. Well, you're going to love this episode then, Lunar. <laughs> this is all wolves all the time, mm -hmm. baby. Mm -hmm. Let me show you guys. Let me show you guys. Okay, here we go. Bella's abusive mommy era. Like, okay, so before we get into it, before we even get into favorite things, I just have to say there was a significant step up in quality between the first book and the second book. And it is largely because Bella decides to embrace her true mommy dummy nature. And um, and that's basically what we get between Bella and and Jacob. And um, like, I'm here for it, okay? I'm here for it. That's what I'm that's See, what I'm saying. But a very different kind of mommy. We talked about last time um that she had like the caretaker mommy sort mm -hmm. of vibe thrust mm -hmm. upon her. And this time it's kind of like mm -mm, I'm I'm a hands off make you chase me kind of mommy. Oh it is God. a very interesting different kind of mommies out here in the world. That I mean. <laughs> but I feel like we need to take a step back and do this our traditional way and start how we start every episode off mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with them favorite things. That's right. Yes. <laughs> so Karen, obviously put down the werewolves. We'll talk about them later. But what is your favorite thing? Okay, or perhaps well, you, you, this is it. <laughs> I mean, you said later, but no, now, because my favorite thing in this book was Jacob's glow up. Like, okay. Okay. Yes. Like basically, which is a side effect of the werewolf. Yes. I mean, basically, this is the book where Jacob actually his werewolf powers awaken, right? And we'll talk more about that in the mm -hmm. summary. But when his werewolf powers awaken, basically, he ages about five years and about, and you can tell that he spent those five years just absolutely busting it at the gym every day. Um, that is what happens. Hello, Rar. <laughs> That is what happens. Okay, so Jacob says, I'm going to I'm going to time travel. I'm going to time travel 5 years and I'm going to spend every one of those time travel years at the gym. He went into the Dragon Ball Z like time workout thing. I can't remember what it's called, but y'all y'all know what I'm saying. He went in there, he came out. Oh, oh no, spoilers. <laughs> spoilers. <laughs> he went in there, he came out. He gets a total glow up, okay? He cuts his hair um and is basically like, you know, I'm going to take care of my appearance now. I actually I'm not going to just be a greasy yeah. like um like mud muffin. I'm going to be like a real boy. And I just love that for him. I love the confidence that he gains. I love what it does to his personality. It gives him this like problematic edge which we will see more details yeah. on in the next book. Um yes. but I just I just thought like it was it was really great for his character so much so that I had to go look up some interviews with with um, Miss Stephanie Meyer asking about the second mm. book. And I found it so interesting that, of course, when it comes to New Moon, she's asked questions about Jacob, right? And she basically says, well, people seem to like him in the first book, so I thought I'd make a whole book about him. It, no forethought, no planning, just like, people seem to like this Jacob kid. Let's do that. Like, literally just <laughs> responding to the feedback. Here's the deal. With as problematic as uh, Stephanie Meyer has been, and and how and how much rhetoric can be 
you know, hinted at in her books. It is fascinating and refreshing to have an author who just is like, no thoughts, just vibes, and then hit <laughs> a a major hit. Like we have J.K. Rowling who's, oh, oh my God, it keeps doing it. It's so sensitive today. My mouse. Uh, <laughs> we have a we have a J.K.R. over here who's like, no, I planned everything out from the very Liar. beginning. Liar. Uh, and just lying through her teeth because God must have this control. And then mm -hmm. you have Susan Collins who truly did plot everything out from the beginning mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. executed it with pure perfection. And now we have uh, Stephanie Meyer who's just like, <laughs> the people wanted more buff boy vamp werewolf. And I, I gave mean, them buff boy werewolf. <laughs> I mean, and I truly. feel like <laughs> it is fantastic. Right? Uh, she is like literally just a no, she is a no plot, pants, vibes only type of role player. Okay. And yep. like it just made this book so much more interesting to me. Um, now I'm saying interesting. I'm not saying good. Okay. The quality oh, no, no, does no. jump up, but don't be fooled. This book still got some serious problems. The prose still leaves something to be desired, but is a significant step too. up. I mean, right. It is a significant step up in not only quality, but intrigue and interest in holding my attention compared to the first book. And it's, it's, it's because it's because we get the Jacob vibes. I truly think that's that. what the first book was missing. I think it truly is 90% of Jacob's extra abs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. They're like, we'll make them hot. <laughs> um, yeah, so yes. it's perfect. That was my favorite thing in New Moon. So Landon, what was your favorite thing in New Moon? We get perhaps my most, I, I think I have been chasing this book, that this spinoff book that we kind of get a glimpse at in this book, uh, I have been chasing it my entire life and have yet to find it. Uh, I am, I've been looking for it for so long. And it is all inspired by these three werewolf characters, who is a side plots of all side plots of drama mm -hmm. happening here. Mm -hmm. um, this is the set, this is the Emily, um, oh my God, not Seth, Sam, Sam. and uh, Leah, uh, beautiful love triangle, yes. in which Leah and Sam were in love supposed to be getting married we're doing the we're doing like the post-college adult thing and uh all of a sudden sam becomes a werewolf and he imprints on her cousin leah and, or, and on her cousin emily and leah is left devastated and then also part of the pact so constantly has to hear all of sam's thoughts about her cousin and all of them have to hear about how fucking heartbroken she is. And everyone is just trenched with guilt and uncomfortableness and angst. And man, do I want justice for my girl, Leah, who is <laughs> truly a certified bitch throughout the entire series. You know what? Uh, you know what's so funny about this is you're like here over here standing Leah and I'm over here standing Jacob because in the Twilight books, the whole reason why we don't get very much of Emily, Sam, and Leah is because they, that trio just exists as a foil to explain certain things about Bella. It's a gender flip version of the, the Bella, same Bella love triangle, right? That's all it is. And Leah is the Jacob of that love triangle, yes. right? And, um, and it is very painful for Sam and Leah to have a mind connection that Emily doesn't have and, and all of these things, right? And, um, and we know that uh, Jacob has the mind connection to the pack and that Edward also has mind reading powers, right? Like it's, it's just, it's just a foil. And so it's very easy to look at this trio and imagine like, oh, this could be a restart, a better version of Twilight with better prose and better plots and more action. Yeah, here's the deal. I don't need a Twilight though. I need Leah to like just go through this whole self worth journey and discover that she is. I here you're not gonna understand this reference, and I don't think any of our viewers will too. But I need Leah to pull a Nesta, and that is another. That is, it, and maybe one day when I make you read Akatar, you'll okay. understand. But I just need her to be like, ah, oh, fuck, I am broken, and now I'm gonna fix myself, and that's what I need. That's I, I don't even care about the love triangle part of it. I need Leah to realize she deserves better than this bullshit. 
Oh, she so does. She so does. And we're we're going to we're going to get more into that in the coming books when we learn a lot more about Leah, but it's introduced in this book and you you can you can even in this book tell exactly where it's going to go, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I I mean the love story doesn't unfoil or anything in a different way. We we learn more about Leah next book. Uh, but it really is just that that seed of like I'm like, wow, in in one fell swoop uh Steffi Meyer I keep wanting to call her Sarah Mass so I keep stuttering on the name uh Steffi Meyer has made an entirely more likable community and interesting more plot than she did the entirety of the with the Cullens like this is I think she tried she succeeded with the werewolves which she tried to do with the Cullens and we'll talk about that a little bit more but mm. <laughs> it maybe it's maybe it's a blessing that she didn't write more about the werewolves maybe uh, yes maybe that's a blessing maybe <laughs> that sounds like a blessing you're absolutely right so, All yeah, right. No surprise that our favorite, our were- the werewolf book, our favorite things are the werewolves. <laughs> okay. No. All right. But in case it has been a while since you have read this uh, classic literature novel, <laughs> uh, let me dive into you, into New Moon, the sequel to Twilight. Uh, basically, it starts on Bella Swan's 18th birthday. Uh, where she is upset about the fact that she's turning 18 because she realizes she is now physically older than her immortal uh, 107-year-old boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Uh, And she has a big old hissy fit about it. But ever the best friend, Alice, wants to throw her a party. And so they go to to Edward's house and have a party. Uh, But disaster occurs while Bella is unwrapping a gift and gets a paper cut. Uh, in which case, <laughs> Jasper, who's the newest to not, <laughs> the newest to not drinking human blood, uh, gets overwhelmed and starts attacking anything he he can, including Bella, who is then knocked backwards and starts bleeding even more. Uh, the Cullens end up like protecting Bella and separating, uh, but Edward, filled with guilt, uh, chooses in this moment to break up with Bella and explain that his entire family is leaving town and does so in a very cruel manner, uh, does put a lot of it on her, uh, does this nice little thing of like, yeah, Bella, you're not good enough for me. Uh, you know, tomfoolery boy stuff. Um, and then the coven and then the Cullens leave. Just straight up leave. All their phones are disconnected. They did the what like the worst of kind of ghosting, and that's where a pivotal part of your life, and then all of a sudden just doesn't exist anymore. Ghosting uh, so before no, the internet was hardcore, y'all. Hardcore. Yeah. Um, or or as we call it these days in therapy co- talk, no contact. Mm. Uh, so no contact. Bella is distraught for months and spirals into. What is truly an indescribable depressive cycle, um, but learns, but but snaps out of it for the betterment of Charlie, because God forbid we make that character suffer anymore, uh, and learns that if she just does things that seek thrill and put her life on the line, she'll remember what Edward said to her and can almost imagine hearing his voice. Uh, so she does starts doing so, and in doing so, seeks comfort with your notorious re- rebel Jacob Black, uh, who will also help her in her self destructive cycle. Uh, and eventually, after a lot of time, she actually starts to realize that she might actually enjoy Jacob's company. Uh, and Jacob, so convinced he's not moving out of the uh, friend friend zone, continues to like hang around her until the mood swings start and the body and the personality starts changing. Uh, And Jacob isn't this happy-go-lucky teen as he goes through puberty, second puberty, werewolf puberty, who knows? Uh, But all of a sudden, after a uh, turbulent evening out where Jacob thought he was getting a date and did not, uh, Jacob disappears and ghosts her as well but she won't take it this time she knows where this guy lives so she shows up at his house and it turns out that jacob is actually a fucking werewolf um 
<laughs> bum, bum, bum. And after a very quick speed through of the werewolf vampire politics, we learn that uh, Jacob and his pact have been protecting Bella from the vampire Laurent, who uh, was once a part of James's coven, uh, and that Victoria, his ex lover, or Victoria, who's still alive, James, you know, he's dead, uh, is seeking revenge for her dead mate. Um, Jacob starts developing physical feelings towards Bella and uh, she just isn't feeling it, but he is also kind of feeling it. And after some back and forth, will they won't lay tension? Um, it just is completely angsty and Bella decides to jump off of a cliff in order to hear Edward's voice. Um, but while this is happening, a series of miscommunications was also happening that has Edward believing that Bella's seeking thrill to he'll hear his voice is actually a suicide attempt gone right that Bella had committed suicide. So in true desperation of never wanting to live in a world without Bella, uh, because of the three weeks they spent together before all of this, uh, Edward runs to Italy where he tries to petition the Volturi, who are the Volturi, Volturi, uh, who are in charge of the vampire world uh, to let allow him to kill himself in which there is now a race against the clock as Alice and Bella try to traverse the world to stop Edward from doing this uh, the Volturi of course are like nah you're too important dude I want your powers uh, and so Edward decides that he instead is going to expose himself and commit one of the most egregious acts against vampirism that you can letting everybody know that vampires exist in order for the Volturi to be forced to kill him. But in a last minute attempt, Bella is able to stop him. Uh, and even though he believes that she is just a figment of his imagination, she is able to convince him that things are all right, that she's still alive. Uh, and after some intense conversation, they are able to let go back to Forks, Washington, even though Bella is human, know that vampires exist. Uh, Alice reveals that there is a vision of the future in which she will be a vampire. Uh, so Return of the Cullens comes. Everyone is doing great. Uh, <laughs> Jacob, not so much. The friend-zoned guy is back in it. And he feels like he's back on the bench. Um, and Bella, just as messy as ever. And that's kind of where we're, we we leave it of course edward does hint at the fact that he's going to require marriage in order to turn her and <sighs> that's the cliffhanger where we end it so in it they're deeply in love they break up she tries to commit suicide ish and then ev everything's all he does actively try to commit suicide and then actively everything is fine things are great and dandy and they might be getting engaged Dun, dun, dun. We'll find out. <laughs> um, and the the funniest thing about the plot of this book is like the the hearing Edward's voice in her head. That is a major plot point in this book, and it doesn't go anywhere past what Bella assumes it is, which is just her imagination. It's literally like she can only imagine the sound of his voice whenever she puts herself in dangerous situations. Her imagination yes. is not good enough otherwise like yes. that's all it is um it's exactly what she thinks so, it is which blows my mind in a supernatural which book is, which is insane um you know refreshing though in the simplicity of it this there's something interesting about this too as far as like reading the plot is that Steffi meyer did this thing that i think she felt was really clever which was that she is copying vaguely the plots of other uh, literary like classic novels and mm -hmm. romance novels so last one was Pride and Prejudice uh, this one is Romeo and Juliet mm -hmm. which is why, why all the suicide so, happens that's why all the suicide happens but she does it so badly but also tips her hand so much that you know exactly what she's doing because there are like Romeo and Juliet quotes throughout the entire novel and mentioned like five it times opens. like it before you even read the opens. first chapter it yes. opens with a Romeo and Juliet quote so like you already know what's going to happen and I do love, this is kind of just spoilers, but I feel like this is the one that is truest and most obvious to the interpretation mm -hmm. of the classical mm -hmm. literature. 
she does this for Eclipse as well, and then breaks it for Breaking Dawn. And we'll talk about that. Like, it just is very interesting to, like, watch this trope have somewhat success in the first one and then be completely overused in the second one. Uh, that it's that it's almost funny. Well, it's the sort of thing that, like, if if I were reading this in a, like, you know, posted chapter by chapter sort of like fanfic thing as opposed to an entire novel that was published, I would think like, oh, this is kind of cool. This is kind of cute, you know, if it was like in a in like a a role play or a post by chapter type of thing. But when it's in a completely published novel that you could have gone back and edited like a zillion times before releasing, it's just kind of like, oh, okay, it's cute. Well, and then also like the thing with the thing with this though too is that like Pride and Prejudice wasn't like the first book is not based like it is based off of Pride and Prejudice but there's nothing Pride and Prejudice about it other than the fact that Edward's like I won't date you Bella yeah no it's uh, like allusions to Pride and Prejudice it's not the plot yeah, of Pride and Prejudice it's not but the this plot. one is allusions to Romeo and Juliet and taking like random plot elements from Romeo and Juliet whether they fit in here or not because the thing is is when Bella does that cliff diving everyone thinks that she was trying to commit suicide because that's what it looks like. Like the fact well, that she's like, no, I was just thrill seeking. Like no one wants to believe her at first because it's completely unbelievable. Well, it's also completely unbelievable because I'm so sorry, but she's been in a self-destructive cycle right? for six months at this point that like her, like there is a point in the book where, where Jacob doesn't want Bella to do anything because she is doing too dangerous. And he even realizes mm-hmm. that like, she's taking it too far. Mm-hmm. And that it's that it's only getting worse and that she is she is self-destructive it, it is there's like a level of cognitive cognitive dissonance that bella doesn't recognize how self-destructive destructive her behavior is that she is kind of in a way attempting suicide in that moment right because she's searching for for edward's voice right <laughs> exactly exactly so so yeah, so if you didn't remember New Moon, now you can remember all the plot points. Um, we're going to get into it. We're going to talk about it. Some of the, you know, the things that we thought were interesting about this book and, um, and, uh, and, and things that were different about it compared to the first book as well. Yes, but first we want to talk about the structure. And we kind of hinted it as far as being like allusions towards, uh, uh, towards what's what call it? Um, uh, Romeo, Romeo and Juliet, Juliet. but I, mm-hmm. but I think that there's also something really important that we need to talk about, and that's the second book breakup. Yes, and that is something that became incredibly popular, I think, in this YA genre. Yeah, um, I mean, it's been a romance I, trope before of Twilight. Like Stephanie Meyer didn't like invent this or anything, um, but no. once Twilight did it and got very popular, if you look at any kind of like ya or new adult targeted romance series that have come out since twilight it is astounding the number of them that have a breakup happen with in in the second or the third book depending on how many books total are in um the series but uh, it's astounding so in traditional romance novels it is it is very much alluded to in the third act breakup so because most most romance novels are stand alone uh and are not series especially during this this era and this time uh, it was very common that stories would end up in the third, in the in the last third and or last uh, in the third of the book would have a break, would have a breakup. Uh, then the fact so that that equals and, and like there is some sense of that even in the original Twilight thing, they end up like running away together and going and evading James. But there is like a sense of like, oh, what if we just left? And it was like, no, you can't do that. Uh, but it was like do that because we need more plot. I can't do that. (laughs) But but I think that writers do this because they get to a point where there is a there is a level of like happiness, and that you have two romance romantic characters who are together, and the death of a romance novel is is like consistency and also uh, contentment. Right. So you cannot have content characters. Yes, you cannot have content content characters. Uh, and so looking at like, what are you going to do with those characters? You really only have two options and that is break up or baby. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it just so happens that the Twilight City, the Twilight series does hit both of those, uh, but hits break up <laughs> but first. Break up is first. <laughs> but break up do be first. Yes. Um, and so the entirety of the, of the book's plot is revolved around this 
miscommunication, lack of commitment, and the desire to make sure that Bella is anything but content. Right. And so she spends this book incredibly distraught because of the breakup. And at the same time that she is sort of um, forced to learn more about the the negative sides of herself and the things that, that hurt her so deeply, like you thought in the first book that the things that hurt her the most were being feeling like kind of an outsider in high school and things like that. Oh, no, no. She was wrong. She was wrong about that. This is the sort of thing that hurts her most, failure in romance. And um, you find out about this at the same time that the supernatural world is starting to open up just a little bit. So we learn a lot more about the werewolves. We learn a lot more about the community and the way that the werewolf community interplays with the um, vampire community. We also learn a little bit more about the global vampire community and like kind of the introduction of the idea that one exists. Because in the first book where we have like Victoria and stuff, like you really, you really don't get a good sense of like what that means because you don't until the second book actually go and meet some of the Volturi. So um, yeah. we find well, out a lot I, more about that in the second book. I also think it is very clear again with the something something just refreshing about Meyer being willing to just be uh, all about the vibes sort of writer. <laughs> um, it's very obvious that there was no intention for expanding the world outside of like the relationship between Edward and Bella and the Collins in the first book. Mm -hmm. There was no, there, there was very little thought or energy put into the idea that there is an entire paranormal existence outside of there. Uh, I, I think that there was hints towards werewolves and stuff like that, but that was probably, I wouldn't be surprised. Obviously I wasn't in the room where it happened, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was put in by an editor or, or, or encouraged upon rewriting because the main point of the story was this insular relationship was the two of them and the direct people that are affected by it. And the humans peoples are boring. So that's why we get a <laughs> neglectful, uh, a neglectful Renee and a completely incapable Charlie I mean. and why we can focus on Edward's side of the family. Yeah. Uh, and then so, so the only two. reason the world gets expanded is as a as a consequence of Bella's bad mm -hmm. mood. That's it. Yeah. And and it, and also like it has to. It, it, there's this there's this continuous growth that a story structure and a series structure has to take because mm -hmm. the world cannot just be Edward and Bella. You have to then expand it. So we go this is the step that we expand into community. Mm -hmm. Uh that we start seeing forks. Uh, that we start seeing the out outler places of Forks and what is really affecting Forks. We still have mm -hmm. our main villains of Laurent and Victoria who are still, you know, circling Forks and and staying pretty close to Forks. Uh, and then the more the more people that are impacted are the werewolves by things. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we get the hints of the worldwide idea, but it's still pretty much there it's the main focus like it's so off-handed it's so not a problem it's it's so hand-waved of being like oh it's fine she'll be a vampire eventually we don't care that you have clearly broken the laws that you were just about to be murdered and executed for like there is there's very little thought there yeah. uh, and we can see the trajectory that it's going and it really doesn't make political sense that the Volturi would just trust Alice's visions whenever she's not one of them. And she's she's from what they see as kind of like a rival coven. So like politically, it doesn't really make any sense. But you know what? It's only book two. So we let them get away with it. Well, <laughs> and also, like, again, I think that this has something to do. Like, I think that if we if 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 Stephanie Meyer was trying to take herself as seriously as JKR and as like Susan Collins took themselves. We would we would rip into this concept. Oh god. We would like <laughs> there and go like how the fuck does the Volturi work even? What's this? What's the history? Like we would we would look at it from a political standpoint that we usually look through a lot of lenses through a lot of this sort of literature. But because we're just like Steffi Meyer has no fucking idea and she has admitted to having no fucking idea. She's not trying to pretend that she does. Yeah. All vibes here. We're we're okay with being okay with the Volturi just being the evil bad guys in the corner that we'll deal with later. 
Yep. So we're going to talk about them. But before before we kind of move on to like getting into some of these like pockets of things that we're talking about individually, I also want to make sure that it's clear, like, even though a lot of things are, are a bit different in New Moon when it comes to the structure, one thing is still the same. You've still got it basically being about Be- Bella's feelings for Edward, although Edward's not there. She's interacting with Jacob. Um, and then at the very end, and it's like that way through like the whole book. And then at the very, very end, we've got this amazing, amazing action scene at the end in Italy. And that's the best part of the book. <laughs> yes. so just like the first no, book, I it's mean, still like that. Very little happens in this yeah. book. Like, I, like, I know I wrote, I, I had a long ass summary, but that's because it was mostly filled with jokes. Like there is very little that happens in the majority of this book, mm-hmm. other than the fact that. Edward and Bella break up and Bella is sad and pining and yeah. is using anything and anyone she can to fill that, to fill that void. True. True. Um, so yeah, right. that's the basics of, of new moon. Let's get into some of the specifics. Well, first we got to take a hot take for Karen here. Oh Karen, God, um, ESWs presents us with Karen's hot takes, uh, hot takes that are sometimes too hot, but are usually right. <laughs> Karen, what's, what's uh, New Moon's hot take? Okay, I've got a scorching one for you this time. Um, no, don't listen to what the narrative tells you. Rosalie was right all along. Okay, Rosalie from the beginning is like, um, this, uh, this Bella girl, she's dangerous and we should not be having her around. We shouldn't be hanging out with a human like this. It's dumb. Bad things are going to happen. She's a, she's a danger magnet. Y'all get fucking rid of her if you're not going to turn her. That's basically Rosalie's perspective. And she doesn't want to turn her because of personal reasons, right? She would prefer if they just got fucking rid of Bella. And this book Okay, if you look, she's my favorite non-wolf character. She's mine now too. She didn't used to be, but now that I've actually read the books as far as the movie, she's she's mine. Now this is only based on New Moon, okay? Um, but as of this point, she's mine now too. Okay, here's the thing though. This book, the events of this book prove Rosalie right, okay? They shouldn't be having human Bella hang around. Bad things are gonna happen. And what happens at the very beginning of this book? Bella gets attacked over it because of a paper cut. Like, all it takes is a paper cut, okay? And bad things happen. Uh, uh, Victoria will not leave them the fuck alone because Bella keeps hanging around, okay? Like, she's right. Now, if you read the book, because we're getting Bella's perspective and the narrative favors her and Edward's um, perspective on things, Rosalie is kind of seen as like, like, mm like no like girl please like what a yeah basically like what a bitch how dare you hate bella so much the rest of the family loves her and rosalie really is like kind of the black sheep of the family or at least bella clearly sees her as the black sheep of the family um and but it's just not but she's right she's right keeping this human bella girl around is is dangerous and they have to deal with it because they won't turn her or cut her loose She's right. It is. It is so interesting how much the novel tries to convince you that Rosalie is the bad guy. Uh, But she's not. Her perspective is so valid. It's so correct. Uh, It is. It is so a hundred percent right. Of like, this girl is a liability. She's gonna get us hurt. We're obviously being chased. Uh, She can't handle this. Like, and, and has nothing to do with the fact that she's a bitch. She just is like this girl's gonna root fuck up my shit and she does and I, she does over and over and she does and rosalie's life has to stop and restart uh because of bella mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so let me ask you this landon because i i wasn't there you know but when by the time new moon came out i was kind of like i this is this is twilight this is annoying so okay in the fandom were there like Rosalie stands, or was it like like everyone hated Rosalie? Like, t- tell me the mood. I think there was mostly um a, a, there was mostly a hate or dislike of Rosalie. I think a lot of people didn't understand her character and what she was doing there, especially in regards to like such a lovable character as Emmett being her partner, and not understanding like I because I, I think that like. None of her family likes her either. So it's I true. think that a lot of like, the fans just like, sat there and was like, no one even likes Rosalie. That, there were that's definitely... true. Her parents, though, at least the way that Bella describes it, their their parents, Rosalie's their least favorite. 
Yeah. Uh, and so I think a lot of people picked up on that and shared that view uh, because I also think that Ro Rosalie is like one of those incredibly complicated characters that uh, Stephanie Meyer didn't mean to write. <laughs> uh, so sometimes, sometimes I think that you just write a character, especially one that's an oppositional for your protagonist. And there is depth there that you don't realize and that people can like project understanding of like why this person dislikes them. Mm. I don't think Rosalie like thinking Bella is a liability is supposed to be a voice of reason in this novels when it so clearly is. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, she uh, is. Because, I mean, because... she she has she has a take that I feel like would make more sense if like um, uh, Esme or shoot, what's the dad's Carlisle. name? Like, or Carlisle, or even Carlisle. Like, why why like... don't Esme or Carlisle kind of agree with her? Like, I think it would make a lot more sense if one of them agreed with her, but like in a kinder, more adult, more mature yes. way. That would make, but they don't. <laughs> Like they don't. why would you give why would you give if you're trying to make this the person that like adults can relate to or the voice of reason within a novel, which is a very common like trope to exist and a, a very common thing to like voice in, why would you give it to the older sister whose only personality is mean and pretty? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, if you want mm -hmm. people to take it seriously and to relate to it, why give it to the like the person that is only ever described as beautiful as too beautiful to exist and too bitchy to get along with mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah exactly lunar says i think this is very true okay so like yeah she's in agreement with like what you're saying about the fandom so like yeah it just because it kind of doesn't make sense because i think it would make a, it would be a lot cooler if like rosalie was like right in a mean way and then like carlisle or esme was like right in a more mature and kind way um that would make a lot more sense to me. But what you have instead is all of the Cullens look, end up looking like in this aspect, in other aspects, that's not true, but in this aspect of the story, they all end up looking like they have absolutely no foresight, no care for actually keeping their family safe and protected. Um, they, they're, they're like thinking, they're thinking so far in the future about this, this imagined whenever date that Bella is going to become a vampire, that they're willing to go through hell for however long it takes for Edward to decide he's ready for her to be a vampire. And they're just going to be patient and, and potentially put themselves in, and, and the people around them in tons of danger until then. And that just doesn't make sense to me. Like Rosalie mm -hmm. is right. She is. There are people in there, like, there have been people who, like, are trying to put, like, I think that are trying to push Edward, like, in the loving way, but it isn't strong enough, and it, it ends up alienating Rosalie, and yes. making her the dis, and making her that if you support Bella in any way, that you dislike Rosalie. And so, and so you said um, something about also about like, because Emmett was considered so well liked in the fandom. So was there a lot of like, you know, Emmett's too good for Rosalie sort of stuff that went oh, yeah. on, his, went on as well. Okay. That would make sense Absolutely. to me. Absolutely, That Emmett doesn't deserve her that like, or like the other way around, she doesn't deserve Emmett. Like why would Emmett fall in love with her? Like no, no understanding for this character. Uh, and thinking the only thing she has going for her is her beauty, which is also why I truly do believe knowing that Stephanie Meyer listens to fans and wants to like explore the aspects in which they are passionate about. That's and, and we'll talk about this obviously later, but I genuinely believe that's why we get Rosalie's story in the third book. Mm -hmm. Like is we, because saw people's, we saw people's takeaways from Rosalie in the second book and went like, whoa, course correction. Oh or, my or gosh. Like, or being... <laughs> I, I'm not even sure if it was like course correct. It was, I, I wonder, I don't know if it was like so much course correction or being like, oh, we need Bella to get along with everybody. Yeah. So I need to then come up with an excuse for why Rosalie is like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense for sure. So yeah, Rosalie's right. Um, She's the, so she's the smartest Cullen. I'm so, I'm sorry that the most beautiful Cullen is also the smartest Cullen, but that's just what's in the book. Just what it, it's <laughs> just what's there. In the book. It's in the source material. Yes. All That's right. my hot take for this one. Okay, so the incident. Let's yes. Talk about um, the incident. Okay. We haven't really fully gotten Jasper's backstory yet at this point, but if you've seen the movies like I ha have, you know what's coming. 
that one's going to be fun. But the, the we're going to talk that, about both the Hall twins. Oh, oh my god. god. Oh god. Oh. Um, the fact that like Jasper's the one that attacks her, and Jasper is also paired with like um Rosalie, who's who's Bella's like favorite Cullen outside of Edward. It's just kind of like it's kind of like it puts Bella in this spot where she can't and and doesn't ever express fear or dislike towards Jasper even though it would kind of make sense if she if she did but she doesn't do any of that is this this whole incident is very strange over a paper cut it's so strange because like that's the other thing too is that th- there is never a point Bella doesn't show fear with any of them there is no, no fear. But she shows fear period. sometimes with the wolves, even though they aren't, they're mm-hmm. like, they're just as destructive. Well, the vampires and wolves are just as destructive. And I'm thinking like back to, I'm even thinking back to Twilight. Mm-hmm. There is no fear with the Cullens at all. There's no questions. There is no worry at all with the Cullens. There is just blind faith. And then all of a sudden James and she meets the other vampires and they set her off. Mm-hmm. And then this traumatic thing happens mm-hmm. and she's attacked and she's bitten and, you know, she's nearly dead, but still has no repercussions, no anything, nothing is set off by this. There is, it is truly like she is a, pre, she has no prey, like a uh, prey instinct. Like she has no <laughs> idea things are happening. Um, completely shut off. Uh, and it feels so weird because it comes out of nowhere. And mm-hmm. then there is still no fear afterwards. Yeah. Like she is nearly, she's nearly attacked and she doesn't care. And the other thing about this incident that doesn't make sense to me is Jasper going bonkers over a paper cut. And yet they trusted him to go to school around over a hundred teenagers. They, they, and like, have you been to a public high school? Man, there's fights. There's blood. Girls having their periods for the first time. People like breaking noses and fingers because they get into fist fights. Like there's, there's blood, not, not daily, but like regularly. Do you know how many band-aids I get as a teacher, as a middle school teacher? Constantly. Do you know how many band-aids I get asked for a day? I'm sure it's, it's probably constant. six or seven. Kids six are seven clumsy. A day. Kids are clumsy and I, violent, okay? They are. I it is it is fascinating to me that that like that there is that like we're we're expected to suspend our belief that much. Yeah. And then like there is a level of like unbelievability about this whole thing too, of like even like the the Stepford way of like they're all waiting for Bella at the bottom of the stairs. That like Bella is spending her 18th birthday with the Cullens, and they're all vampires who don't eat or celebrate birthdays at all, who don't who don't recognize like anything like this. And there's like a very like Stepfordian, it's weird. like mood to the whole evening and the whole thing feels so off that it makes me as a reader be like what the fuck cult shit is happening right now uh <laughs> it does feel very cult it feels very cult. i almost expect like esme to pop out with the little like um the like cult woman baby voice you know that some of them do like i almost expect that that's not how she talks in the movie but you almost think she that. should <laughs> But it is like this weird thing to and like the like the level of like trying to get into it of being like, God, they all dressed up for this. This is like they all put on their finest stuff and dressed up. They look like they're going to church. Shit. For real. They, they look truly, like they're about to get in the suburban and go to church. They cooked a meal that only one of them could eat <laughs> have have present. Like it just feels so awkward and so disbelieving that then when the paper cut incident happens. Uh, everything is fine. And then also the other thing too is others get overwhelmed. Obviously at this point she gets pushed back. She cuts her hand more. And now it's like truly like a cut. Yeah. And now it kind of makes sense if one of the vampires was like losing control. But then like all of them have to leave the room. Yeah. And I'm just like, God, if you're that close, if that is the level that we're at at this moment where you like are like Alice can't even be in the room and it's just like, I'm sorry, I have to go. Like, 
It doesn't we really make sense. We should not be going to school, and I, people. And I, <laughs> and I assume we're supposed to believe that it has something to do with, like, Bella being particularly tasty or something like that. But still, we this is more of, like, the just vibes, no plot situation. We yes. still don't know why Bella's particularly tasty because Stephanie Myers hasn't figured it out yet either. We don't learn well, that until multiple books later. <laughs> we, we never learn it. There I think it's implied. Ex- I think it's implied about why it happens um, at certain plot points in Breaking Dawn. But we'll get to that when we get to that. Okay. I, it, from my memory at this point, I think that that's one of the reasons why I suspend. We understand why Edward has mm-hmm. a connection with her mm-hmm. and has and like and, and is explained with this whole, uh, you know, scent scent of the sun or whatever. Um, but like, there is no explanation as in in my memory of like why every vampire reacts to her this way. Yeah. And if there is, it obviously did not stick enough in my brain to make it <laughs> worthy of understanding why vampires are acting like this in book two. Like it makes no sense. It makes no sense. And this no incident sense. is crazy. It's literally, it's literally like, shoot, I gotta get Edward out of this book so we can spend some more time with Jacob, this well, popular character, and we can have the second book break up. How do I do it? And it's like paper cut. <laughs> like I think as an adult reading this, I understand why Edward does it. Mm-hmm. I do too. I'm like, wow. I don't really disagree with him. It's a fucking paper cut. You're absolutely right. I then disagree with everything else that happens afterwards. Well, true. <laughs> like how but like as- some of the things that happen afterwards, like when he comes back and he realizes he needs to say, and it's like, well, wait a second. You All that chaos well, happened over a paper cut. And, and now we're right the first time, my friend. <laughs> And now you're also then standing your morals on like having to get married in order to right. Oh my god! Anyway, we're going to talk about that next book. Next book, Uh, next book. But (laughs) next book, next book. Um, but there is this idea of being like, I get it. I get what Edward is doing and why Edward is going for it, and should have a hundred and ten percent stayed away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because like the thing is is like yes in a lot of ways because he was turned at 17 he has arrested development at that age but there are still many many ways in which he is more mature than bella and him leaving is one of those ways yes and i I think that that might also be where my hiccup is is the arrested maturity of him of like i i need it to be one or the other friend i know like i need you to either i I can't, I can't have you, I can't constantly be thinking like, why aren't you using your 107 years of logic yeah. in this moment? And mm-hmm. instead thinking with your 17 year old mm-hmm. brain. Mm-hmm. And why are you thinking with your 107 year old brain when you, when everybody else around you is thinking like their physical ages? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's very confusing. It's like a, it's kind of, the metaphor gets a bit muddled because there's no consistency in that. Um, I also in this picture just want to bring up once again that uh, Carlisle and Esme are supposed to be 22 and 24. That's all. The oldest. That's all truly, I just need to bring have you, up. Okay, have you seen the TikTok discourse about how, how all the 20 something Gen Zers look like they're 40? Truly some Gen yes. Z, some Gen Z 20 year olds right uh, there. My God. Truly. <laughs> truly. <sighs> all right. And the hair. Okay, we'll talk about that when we get to the movie. Anyway, I have thoughts on their hair. It's so bad. When we get to the movies, so we'll bad. talk about that. All right. Okay, First, so before we get farther, <laughs> yeah, before we get farther, <laughs> we want to remind you guys, Interstage Window is brought to you by Audible. Um, I am reading all the Twilight books on Audible, and the narration is pretty freaking good. I strongly recommend it. Um, here is here is our link. Uh, if you would like to sign up for Audible too, you can do so at audibletrial.com slash interstage window. I'm going to say like, since I started doing Audible with interstage window, it's how I read all my books now. I freaking love it. I have a pretty extensive Audible library at this point, and, um, and I'm a fan, truly a fan. Uh, and every time that we, we do this, we also like to give another book recommendation. If you're kind of like, you know, I, I've read Twilight. I want something else, Karen. Don't tell me to go download New Moon. So Landon, what is our recommendation for this week? Just try to clear because I have two. Um, did I talk about Bride last time? I don't remember us talking about Bride last time. I don't recall what we talked about with Twilight. Then let's talk about our beautiful vampire, uh, wonderful book series by Allie Hazelwood. Uh, It is a young, new adult romance novel uh, that takes place in 
some undesignated time in the present-ish different world, where there are three different fraction factions of existence and creatures. There is the vampire faction, the werewolf faction, and the human faction, and they are all seemingly on the precipice of war constantly. And we have our beautiful protagonist, Misery, who has spent who spent most of her childhood growing up as a uh, as basically a um, form of like a hostage, for lack of a better word, um, collateral in the human lands to make sure that there wasn't a war that started. They they would trade one human child and one vampire child to ensure that no one's lives were in danger okay she spent so most very, of her life like, there royal families used to do that this makes very, sense very royal family okay yes uh and is informed that she will be marrying the alpha of the werewolf okay so she's uh, she's warded up all three ways she's warded up all three ways she got she's a and, vampire uh, with human parents who's going to marry a werewolf got it she's a yeah well no the the humans haven't really been kind to her she's very she's very anti-human actually uh, oh really um, <laughs> which is fine. We all are in some ways. Uh, and it is the romance story between uh, the low and misery and some political intrigue and interesting uh, things. Her best friend is missing and she's trying to figure out what is happening there. And it's probably, it's actually the four point, it's the highest rated book that I have read that and listened to on Audible and is new uh, this year. So I, it is my highest rated new book this year. Okay. Uh, and I listened to it on Audible and also read it, and it was fantastic. And if you're looking for vampires versus the werewolves versus humans, this is the book for you. Okay. And so you guys know, if you've been following us for a while, um, how much the like sheer volume of books Landon reads. So if she's saying it's her, her best one so far this year, and you're thinking like, but it's only March. No, that's a lot of books. There's a lot, there's a lot of books since January, I can guarantee you. It's it's been a heavy reading year, uh, but <laughs> absolutely would do that if you're looking for something. And then I just wanted to shout out too if you're looking for something more um, fantasy driven. I recently fell into the From Blood and Ash, which also has some fun. There there are no humans. It's more it's more uh, vampire werewolf relations, and uh, a woman has been kidnapped by uh, the evil vampire. The evil vampire sector and is forced to take on the realities of the world that she actually lives in. It's oh. a lot of fun uh, and kind of trashy romanticy if you're looking for that. So those are All our right. two recommendations for Blood and Ash and Bride. Okay, so we got a quality recommendation and a trash recommendation. Pick your poison. <laughs> Pick your poison. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, audibletrial.com slash interstage window. You do not have to keep it. If you want to do just your 30-day free trial and cancel it, that still supports the stream. So um, you no, no requirement to, uh, to help us out with that link. So yeah, thank you very much. Let's move on. All right. Let's talk about the Volturi. Because I do want to respect the flimsy political system that exists in this world okay uh, because i, I love think the way they're styled in the movie my god this screenshot so is just the yeah anyways uh, the volturi all, okay so as of this book who are the volturi first of all just very quickly and i know this will be more relevant in the movies i have to sh shout out my one of my favorite uh celebrity crushes which is jamie campbell bauer oh uh, the god. nice blonde one in the corner uh <laughs> he he somehow fit into all three of my fandoms because he played minor roles in all three of them and this is his and i just need to shout that out that's true that's true he just keeps <laughs> popping up places in this time period you up. know it's perfect <laughs> um, so yeah who are the volturi right. what, what's their deal but in this book because we get more volturi in later books but as of this book for lack of a better frame of res reference, the Volturi is the p the royal family mm -hmm, of vampires. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, located in Italy, we get the sense of a hint that they have overthrown the Transylvanian government that existed prior and have instead then instilled uh, a system within Italy uh, of creating vampires and overseeing the rules of vampirism and they have been able to do this because they have gained and garnered powerful allies uh that have magical powers so mm -hmm. they are the collectors especially uh, especially our front man is the collectors of anyone with sort of hyper magical powers our edwards our alice's uh, the ones that are, can truly have these gifts yep. and they use these gifts and and keep well-fed all of the people 
in their government so that they can then disperse these creatures these vampires with highly needed gifts to go anywhere in the world to take care of any problems or any other powers that might be uh, a forcing against them yep so basically the 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 lore things that you have to remember to understand the volturi is one it is rare for vampires to do more than pair up singular vampires and pairs of vampires are relatively common but once you get a third vampire in there it is very hard for vampires to continue to get along they don't do that they don't Which do is that. so funny because we've only ever seen pair. We've only right? ever seen three or more vampires. Right. Like, like even even James and Laurent and like Victoria. Those three. Those are three, which is apparently rare. We haven't ever seen <sighs> two or a singular vampire by themselves. But we're told this. But we're told this but that this is this. this is common and it's rare for vampires to group up further and that they only do so in like very special circumstances and it doesn't last a long time like they do not they do not do this for for long stretches of time only only short stretches so the volturi um are are unique in the sense that they were able to command a group without destroying themselves the other thing that you have to remember is that these special gifted vampires are also incredibly rare so the volturi's ability to be like good enough leaders and create good enough structures so that vampires can can live with them in larger groups and especially powerful vampires can be brought into their fold it really speaks to like their leadership quality and ability and of course the the heads of the volturi are able to use this to kind of enact their will on vampire kind worldwide which nobody else has a big enough coven and enough powers to be able to do because of these factors uh that second one is my absolute biggest oh god why is there a biggest gripe with mm -hmm. uh my biggest gripe with the entire series is because we only are introduced with two characters that basically have these special powers yeah we have edward <laughs> we have bella we have alice we have Carlisle, and those are the three, those are the four with confirmed special powers. You then have the other ones that are like extra powerful. Uh, you then have James, who is like a special tracking power, and then you will have Victoria, who has like an exit power. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. six out of the ten vampires we have met, not even including the Veltori, have special powers. Right. And that's more than half. So yeah. that's not rare. <laughs> so we're told it's rare but we are never seen we don't see this really because we never really um get there's there's just not that many named vampires that are just regular ass vampires um they all either are special in the sense that they have special powers or they're special in the sense that they're cool with larger groups which most vampires supposedly are not yeah um so the Volturi have this network of of vampires and are able to exude their will and their rules and their laws and ha and because of that have taken over mm -hmm. and people see them as uh reluctant leaders like there isn't a there isn't a level of like worship or follow from the vampire community but there is a there is a aspect of fear yeah um and we meet some of the coolest ass vampires in my in my favorite, my fair, my favorite being uh, Jane Malek, who I think I need. God, did I read so much fan fiction about those two? <laughs> uh, and yes, they're twins. Sorry about it. <laughs> oh my gosh! And we don't get to enough of them in the books. Truly, we do not. No, we don't. Um, uh, but and Jane, and it's, and it's Jane has of... the. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say very quickly for those of you who don't remember, Jane is the one that looks at a bitch uh, and they feel pain. Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, we don't know what Alec does. <laughs> yeah, not yet, but we'll learn. <laughs> um, so when, this is kind of like just a little aside where like this, this really just proves how Twilight is vibes only because they're positioned as reluctant leaders and yet they have very specific ideas of how vampire kind should be. And they clearly have very direct um, and uh, political ambitions and are willing to enact these political ambitions, right? Mm -hmm. So they have this, they have a couple of ideas. One, vampires got to stay secret. We don't, we don't want word of us getting out, period. That is, that is bad. We never learn why it's bad. It's Twilight. There's vibes only, right? We don't know. 
And then vampires. Here. Yeah. And then the other thing is like they're very specific about like how vampires are supposed to interact with humans as far as like humans that they're planning on turning or whatever. And they're willing like if if stuff goes wrong, they're willing to send out like little little squads of an army to go enact their will by killing vampires that break the rules. So like they're reluctant leaders and yet they're willing to enact violence like whenever based on their whims, just like any other strong political power would do. So like they're not reluctant at all. <laughs> they're not. And yet we're told they are. The politics of this make no sense. This is a vibes only king of the vampire situation. 100% vibes only. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there is no thought follow through. There is just all of this. Um, and, you know, it's fine. <laughs> There are yeah. some things that make me question it. There are some things where I'm like, man, maybe we deserved better. This would have been, I think Twilight would have been a really cool fucking world uh, if it had been written with the stilts and the foundation to actually build it up. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. And it's fine. <laughs> yep. So so the Volturi, that's what they are. That's what they do. <laughs> They're vampire All kings. Right. They're okay. Vampire king. Oh my gosh. Okay. 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 So... Bella. Of course, the story is from Bella's perspective, so we have to talk a lot about Bella. And this gets into like why I found this book so much more enjoyable than Twilight. Bella's just a much more interesting character when she's allowed to be evil. And without Edward, she's like such a bitch, okay? Her inner monologue has always been rude, but um, but now now Bella gets to face consequences for being a bitch, okay? In this book, this is something that we didn't mention in the summary, but in this book, all of her friends are like, Bella, you're way too into your boyfriend and you clearly don't care about anyone else, so fuck you, bye. Um, well, yeah. And she deserves I, it. She deserves it. She 100% deserves it. And, like, we start seeing, yeah, those friends realizing how shitty of a person she was because I think that was one of our biggest gripes from the last yes, one. Yes, and no one, like, why no one is cared. someone, everyone's so obsessed with her? And here it was like, it, they didn't even say bye. They just stopped hanging out with her. They're like, that was a bummer. We're going to kick her out of the chat, okay? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I think, like, obviously Jessica Jessica tries to, at some point, befriend her. Angela does as well, like, tries to make those connections. But it's really, really obvious that they have just, like, they're like, wow, this girl, like, flew into town, had a relationship that lasted 3.2 seconds, and is now suicidal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the most realistic thing that I think that happened was how everybody treated Bella. Yeah, everybody's like <laughs> not here for it. And it's like, You're yeah, because like, nobody would be here for it. It's like the only reason that Jacob even sticks around that he tolerates her nonsense is literally just because he thinks he's going to get Edward's sloppy seconds. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that the other thing, too, is that like is Stephanie wrote Bella not like I think Stephanie didn't realize how much. Bella sucks until <laughs> this book and she embraced it and yeah. there was an understanding because every because it is that like honesty of everyone else around her treats her that way mm -hmm, uh mm -hmm. and yeah I think that there is something so wholesome and funny about you know little Jacob wagging his tail wanting to hang around Bella and just put up with a, whatever shitty behavior he she is putting towards him true um because that's incredibly realistic Yes, and, it's, uh, and it makes and... me understand, like, this book made me understand why Bella as a person is in love with Edward as a person, because she is a vampire. She's an emotional vampire. She's just like him. That's why when she's like, I don't care that you killed people. I don't care that you've done all these shitty things. I don't care that you might not have a soul. I don't believe you, but I, I don't care even if you don't. Like, you get why she doesn't care, because she is already a vampire. She is. Yes. I think, like, truly there was a disservice, and we can talk about, we'll talk about this more when the movies come around, but how Kristen Stewart played her so much more likable than she actually is. It's true. And I think that that is truly the disservice, because in our brain, we're like, wow, Bella was at least somewhat decent, and she's not. She's not. She sucks. Mm -mm. And she no. embraces her own suck here. She's so f obsessed with doing suicidal shit in order to hear a man's voice in her head. Yeah, she thinks she thinks that everyone else is so crazy um, to believe that she would kill herself. And it's like, Bella, what? They're not crazy. They're not crazy to, to believe that you would do that. 
you know? Babes, you've been trying to kill yourself for six months now. Like, come right? on now. Yeah, like, it's just, it's insane. So she is equally as toxic as Edward is. I get why she didn't think it was crazy that he was spying on her in her bedroom. I get why she doesn't care all the terrible things that he's done in her in his life. I get why she's so hell-bent on being a vampire because then all of her shitty self would be justified because at least she would actually be a monster. That's my takeaway from Bella in this book and why she, she is such a much more interesting character to me, why I enjoyed this book so much more because it truly embraces who she actually is on the page. I love it. Yep. It's good. I love it. It's fantastic. Yes. All right. So what makes, oh, before we go to the werewolves, one oh. other point, one other point on Bella. Okay. Um, What this book does that I think like continues the trend of um, Twilight really continuing to resonate with a certain group of people at that certain time is that this book oh, yes. feels, yeah, this book feels just like it feels to, um, oh my gosh, we reached 500. I'll talk about that in a minute. Thank you so much. Thank you so much um, uh, to, for my, to my 500 follower. Oh my God. Ah, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, we have to finish Twilight and don't go anywhere, Mr. 500. I gotta talk to you. I gotta talk to you uh, later. <laughs> okay, so, all right. This, where Twilight is a realistic depiction of what it feels like emotionally to have that first real love as a teenager, this is emotionally what it feels like to have that first real breakup as a teenager. It really Absolutely. does feel like you are dying. Like, you just... Deliberate you, it, yes. You have Ugh. no concept. You have no... Get it, Karen! Thank you, Lunar. Thank you. You have no, like, you, you have no, like, forethought into, like, don't worry, other loves will come. Like, it's not that big mm -hmm. of a deal. This was just my first one. It's mostly hormones. It's You have no concept of that. And no. reading this book, the depression that Bella goes through, the, the complete lack of self-awareness that she goes through, that is exactly what it feels like the first time you break up with a real love when you're in high school. That's what it feels like. A hundred percent. It resonates so purpose, like purposefully. Like it, mm -hmm. it, I got it. I was reading this as a teenager and understood all of it. Yeah. Like it, it felt real and visceral and correct. And I think that is something that like, especially with these first two books that Stephanie was able to capture Yes. of like, what is that feeling of what is love? And what is heartbreak? Yep. And what are you willing to do, like, as a teenager? Like, I, we're joking about her being self-destructive and stuff like that. But shit, that's what we did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, you you all of a sudden needed to chase the pain. Like, as a teenager, there is, like, this phenomenon of needing to chase the pain away from with risky behaviors. Yes. And that happens here. And it's crazy. And, it's, and it, I think what makes it even crazier is how vocalized it is and how real it is. And mm -hmm. that, like, I think drove a lot of fans during that time like to be like what the fuck is happening is this play about us sort of thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes so yeah um yeah i i like break up bella better i like angry suicidal um you know bella better because she basically just like uses and abuses jacob and i find that so much more interesting than her pining after edward that's the conclusion that's the conclusion of bella in this book yeah, I think there's like a level of honesty. And I also think she found a voice. She was less pants. Yeah. I mean, I know we have this big argument that she's pants and stuff, but but I think that she has more of a personality. She she's has way more of a personality. That is, distinct, that is distinct from like someone trying to live in her shoes and live her story. Right. That she is make she as a character is making her own decisions. Bingo. Yes. Okay. So I know what you guys are really here for. You're here for wolves. It's time to talk about some wolves. Okay. There are massive, okay, there are massive essays, video essays, ev mm -hmm. uh, everything about the way that the werewolves are portrayed in Twilight. We are going to talk about it within the context of the books themselves, okay? So before we get too much into it, I just want to acknowledge the quileudes that are depicted in the books. There are real life quileudes, okay? We're not going to talk about that because there are people that have done it better. There are actual mm -hmm. quileudes that have spoken out about this, and you should be listening to their voices, not two girls that are only experts in fandom. Okay. Yeah. We're just, no, just going to stay in our lane. That's what I want to say. 
And I would highly encourage it too. Like, yes. like if you are a bit, a bit curious about the fallout and everything that happens and, and some things that we might touch on and talk about, and you want to know information and you want to form opinions, please go seek out the, those uh, yeah. because it is important to listen to the voices of the people who were and were not affected by this and also did the immense research and uh, have the lived experience of, of, of the effect of all of this. Yes. Okay. So now that being said, why within the context of the book itself, not considering the real life quibutes, why, why are they, why is it still super racist? Okay. Let me tell you why. Um, okay. I remember, remember my experience with Twilight was I had seen the movies back when they were coming out. I had tried to get into the books because it was like the new hotness. And I was like, ew, no, like I tried, I, I couldn't do it. So I never, I, I did not read New Moon. And I know now that my, that I don't, I really didn't read New Moon because there were things that I learned in this book that either I had forgotten or I did not know. Okay. And one of them is, why, why are there no old werewolves? There's no old werewolves because what makes the werewolves become werewolves is the fact that vampires show up. So basically the Quileudes are just, they're living their lives. They're having, it's like, it's all legend. It's all history. It's like, it's like all of this, right? And then the Cullens show up and it starts activating their werewolf gene because the Cullens show up. Okay. So the Quileudes, they get no choice. They are not werewolves without a threat of vampires why this is this choice like completely strips them of any collective agency that they could possibly have and i hate it i didn't realize that like in my mind yeah. they were always werewolves but no they're only werewolves because the cullens show up it's so dumb i don't like it yeah they they are they this is a like their like lycanthropy is a side effect uh, of of a dormant gene that comes to life because there are vampires within the region yeah. and that their jobs were to protect the area from the bloodsuckers from from vampires so it's kind of just uh, like it's like it's like so why you know it's like so messed up that like okay so basically the only reason that they have to deal with the supernatural nonsense is because the cullens decide our colony is forks mm -hmm. what really and we're supposed to think yep. the Cullens are the good guys. Huh? And then I also think there is like this then you then take the only people of color in the book canonically and you make them act as one thing for one unit without any sort of gripe or disagreement or impact on what it's having to those characters. Like I think that there's also something there too of like being like, oh, and then conveniently all of the people of color in the book are the enemies to the family that we're supposed to be rooting for. Yeah. So let me like remind y'all also like from, because this is from Bella's perspective and Bella is team Edward. Okay. Basically from her perspective, like the vampires are good. Their violence is cool and justified. And, and the Cullens are, they're, they're good vampires. They're different. Right. But the wolves and their violence and their immaturity is worthy of being feared. Remember the incident from the beginning of the book? It makes no sense. Okay. But because it's, it's from Bella's perspective, that's what we're given. Yeah, and there, there's like direct, right? It's not even just the incident. Jasper loses control. And that's the thing. It's all about control. It's all about the loss of control. That's what Bella fears in the later part of the book. Yes. But we watch Jasper lose control. Mm -hmm. There is no negative effect on Bella. Bella isn't upset at all. Never gets upset. Doesn't have any forethought weeks later being like, oh, maybe I'm traumatized by this thing. Like, there is no connection, no reference to Jasper's lack of control again. But then as soon as other creatures are losing control around her, that's when the fear kicks in stupid uh and it's all about also it's all about like rage when these characters get too angry things happen mm -hmm. uh when characters like and and i think that there's a lot of and again i know we don't want to bring out outer parts but it's it's how things play into the stereotypes of that all of a sudden like oh sam got so angry that he ended up scarring his wife's face but he doesn't hurt bella like, but the but thing is, is like Bella. he doesn't hurt Bella, and yet she's scared. But then Jasper hurt her, and she's not scared. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. It doesn't and make it's, sense. It's these high emotional lack of control creatures 
are the things that scare her and the things that put her off and are the and are the things that are like in some way Bella does a really good job of towing the line of, of like she is the advocate for the werewolves in the vampire community, mm-hmm. but she herself still believes these negative things that are being said. Right. About the werewolves. Yeah. She only, she only, the only reason that she does this for the werewolves is because she has affection for Jacob. That's the only reason if she didn't have some affection for Jacob, for what he did to like help her through the time that Edward was not there. I don't think she would do this advocacy for the werewolves. I don't think she would no. do it. She only does it because Jacob was the one that was there for her because she'd already fucked up her relationship with all of her human friends. But Jacob thinks he's going to get sloppy seconds, so he's there for her. And so now she advocates for the werewolves. And then also, like, the thing that is important to talk about that, like, we'll touch on it later, but I kind of want to bring it up now, is that, like, this problem continues to exist because Edward makes the choice to come back and bring the Cullens back. And so not only is Bella aware of like the impact, there is no denying that the Cullens are aware of the impact that they're having. And that continues to be a problem because throughout the rest of the books, we see, we see uh, members of the tribe become turning less and less the younger they are. Like we see someone like who's 11 turning mm-hmm. like, there is a huge issue with that, like, okay, we're choosing to do this. It's no longer out of ignorancy. We're choosing to have the negative impact on these people. Yeah, and they must be choosing it because we learn in this book that um, the Cullens came to Forks during the time of, like, Jacob's um, great- grandfather or great-grandfather or something like that. And um, And that's when the pact is made between the werewolves and the Cullens that the Cullens are allowed to live there, you know, close to Quileute land, so long as they do not harm any humans, right? So they make the deal with the werewolves so that they can live in this area, right? So that they don't have to keep searching for for their the home that they're going to stay in, right? And then, so the Cullens did that generations ago. Later on, because the Cullens have to move every so often if they want to pretend to be humans, right? Because they don't age. So they, they leave. They eventually come back to Forks a couple generations later. And, um, and, so, and there's been no werewolves in that in-between time, which is why none of the, the elders in the tribe can turn into werewolves, right? So the Cullens have direct proof that their presence is what causes this. And yet Carlisle brings the family back and Carlisle's supposed well, to like care. Yeah. And I think that there is like a level of that. You could try to work your way around of, of like, well, if there were we- werewolves before then like that, they were already werewolves when the Collins made the pact. That makes sense. I agree with that. And then, then maybe, come back. and then maybe, and then maybe Carlisle didn't know when they came back that second time right. before meeting Bella, still didn't know that there was an impact, like maybe they, he just thought it died off, didn't know the, the closeness or the relation. But then when Sam turns, the moment, then they know. It is the, and even then, you could say because there wasn't a connection, they didn't have conversations, like that is can- canon. Bella then does. And so at the mm-hmm. end of New Moon, they definitely... There is no other argument. There is no other excuse. They know without a doubt that they are the ones negatively impacting yes. the future and survival of this of this of a people. And they still choose to come and do that anyway. And then get mad when the werewolves get mad at them. Right? Like you're supp- we're supposed to believe that Carlisle is this sort of enlightened type of vampire that like cares in a way that other vampires do not because he's so good at controlling himself around blood, right? We're supposed to believe this. And yet he is shown direct harm he is doing to an entire group of people pain he is putting them through distress that he is putting them through and he says not my problem no comments no thoughts i'm never going to express anything in regards to this and i'm just going to stay chilling in forks because my son found a girlfriend i do think that it is a really cool idea i do think it's an interesting take on werewolves i actually prefer this than the lycanthropy disease trope like, like that we see in a lot of fiction, of the genetic. Element. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of really cool things, especially like when you then have 
like the concept of a pact versus like a pack versus like a family and the genetic connection and component. The issue is then when it is only people of color that then can have this. Right. Uh, and that's not even <laughs> getting into the gender fuckery that the werewolves get into. We'll get into yeah. that in the next book when we talk a little oh. bit more about Leah, because there's there's gender fuckery going on here, too. Yeah. Um, so I think that there's a lot of basis of a creative way of taking the werewolves and doing it in a new way. I appreciated that. I think that it just is so completely obvious that Stephanie Meyer had no no thoughts, just vibes yeah. when it came to the implications. And and to be honest, in 2004, and when when Twilight started coming back out, it wasn't that big of a fucking deal. People well, we did not didn't, see it because the internet didn't we, exist we knew in was, the way that it does now for people to understand well, that and, they weren't already affected by it. And also, like, and also, I will like the forefront of of recognizing our by like the, I think that there we, there's also been a lot of like growth in a, a way of of understanding of diversity and and oh for sure and for sure we're always growing in that like regard. That Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I think like 20 years later, we're looking at this going, oh, this did not age well at all. <laughs> and and it was well known at that point in time, but it was like, oh, this, this was bad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> it's worse than you remember, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's, this isn't yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, Carlisle's not a good guy, not as good as he thinks he is, in my opinion. Yeah, he's not. And I think that the, the fact that he continues to house his family in Forks, uh, n with the full knowledge of what he is doing to the Quileudes that live in that live in the area, I think is really the proof that he's not a good guy. He's lying to himself when he's pretending that there's such a thing as like vegetarian vampires that are good, actually. Like he's pretending he's not. Um, he is not thinking about the scale of what he's doing at all. I think Carlisle suffers a lot uh, from what a lot of characters, I think, in this series suffer from. And that is the, the unfortunate reality is that when it comes to wisdom, a character can be only as wise as its author. True. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> everything else can be inflated and, and even intelligence to an aspect, although I will say intelligence is also one of those things that has difficulty as a writer. You need a, you you need a cannot... good editor. You need an editor smarter than you if you want to do something like that. Yes. <laughs> um, and when you have vibes only sort of like going into things it's all going to be surface level yeah. on the surface carlisle is the wise one but he is by no means wise mm -mm. Mm -mm. and i think it's easy to 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 see his good qualities about like the people that he chose to turn the people that he chose to bring into his vampire family like i can see like some goodness in those choices but i don't think he's a, a particularly moral person i think he's got complex morals just like most people do he's good in some ways and he's shitty in some ways but i don't think he purposefully does no, not on purpose. <laughs> I think that is another example of yeah. accidentally writing a character deeper. I think Rosalie and Carlisle suffer from that mm -hmm. the most. Mm -hmm. And in opposite ways. I think Carlisle is supposed to represent the father figure, the all-knowing father figure of a uh, elevated type of being. All wisdom and all wise and all kind, but allowing kids to make their own choice in some mm -hmm. aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a capital G in front of his name, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, as I don't a representation. disagree. I think so, too. Um, but you could only write capital G Carlisle that way if you understand the implications of all the decisions you're making. And right. as a writer, I don't think, I don't think Stephanie Meyer did. No, nah, because she's just here for the vibes. She's just here for the vibes. So yeah, um, so that that's our that's our takes on on the werewolves. Um, if you want to know more about those, like literally, just type Twilight Werewolves into the YouTube search, and you will find much deeper dives on them. But this is the werewolf yes. book, so we wanted to give our thoughts um, on the matter. We're going to start check. something here uh, <laughs> that I think is important starting here in New Moon because I don't think it was a real thing in the first Twilight. Uh, and that is, where are we standing as far as the age-old debate, the debate that sparked a fandom 
that I think defined a generation of readers that has really solidified itself into the concept of how we market uh, both YA movies and YA books. And that is the Edward versus Jacob problem Mm. and the temperature check on that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Um, so Landon, after this book, are you team Edward or are you team Jacob? Okay. I need to set the scene for a second. (laughs) We just need to talk about this for a moment. I received the Twilight books, Twilight, New Moon, and Eclipse in a three book series on Christmas Day. I want to say I was probably in eighth grade. Eighth grade Landon did this. Uh, So it's 2008 or 2007 Christmas. And I stay up all night and read the first Twilight book. All night. I pull my first one of my first all-nighters. And I go and I grab the second one because I am in love with Edward and Bella. This is what love is. This is what I expect when I enter high school to happen the next year. This is what's going to happen to me. Exactly all of this. I grab the next book. I get about 55 pages in. And at 7.30 fucking a.m. in the morning, I chuck the book across the room. Uh, break the spine because I threw it so hard because Edward fucking broke up with with Bella. I just need people to know where I'm coming from. That I cannot, as an adult woman, be unbiased in this choice because uh, the emotional eighth grader in me still has a reaction upon this question. The (laughs) obvious answer is Team Edward. There is no such thing as Team Jacob. It never existed. He never had a chance. (laughs) So you guys are not surprised, right? As you know, Landon, um, she's a Draco girly. Um, there's a reason why in The Sims 2 Legacy that we we used to do, um, and we'll come back to it at some point, we had her marry, um, her Sim marry Malcolm Landgrab. Okay. Um, obviously, there is no world where Landon uh, can get on board with the idea of Jacob as the love interest. It's just never going to happen. It doesn't, guys. It doesn't exist. <laughs> I don't, it does not compute. It might be the lesbian in me. It might be the eighth grader in me. It could just be the fact that Jacob deserves so much better than Bella. Uh, it could be any of the above. Edward is the obvious answer. <laughs> I think that as far as these temperature checks go, it's going to be pretty pretty on par for that unless I throw a curveball in there uh so when I come to ask you Karen team Edward or team Jacob that's where the differentiation I think is gonna happen okay (laughs) all right so here we go team Jacob obviously what the fuck I mean okay Bella is such a much more interesting character when she's not pining, when she's actually thinking of like what her potential partner is truly adding to her life, which is what she does with Jacob. She's so much more interesting when her energy vampire gets to come out and she gets to use and abuse the man that she's with. This is the Bella that I want. Okay, this is the Bella that I want to continue to see. I want to continue to see a Bella that's so confident that she doesn't care about the other people around her and that... um. She slowly just gets worse and worse forever. And that can happen with Jacob. We could have that, Bella. And I think that would be so entertaining and so fun. I am full team Jacob all the way. Mommy, Dommy, Bella with little um, puppy boy Jacob. Yes, thank you. That's how I feel at the end of New Moon. We'll see if this changes. Make predictions. How do y'all think I'm going to feel at the end of Eclipse? How do y'all think I'm going to feel? I want to know. Let me know. I have predictions and I, it could go two ways. It could go one of two ways. Either we're going to enjoy the problematic nature of Jacob even more, or we're going to realize that a 17 year old boy throwing the hissy fit that he does in the eclipse is not attractive and cannot be dealt with. Those are the two options. Okay. You got to (laughs) come, you got to come back. You got to be right here on twitch.tv slash it's Karen Terry um, in April to find the answer. Okay. Maybe, who knows, maybe I'll be team something else. <laughs> we'll <laughs> team find Victoria. out. Victoria. <laughs> team Victoria. <laughs> All right. Okay. We're also going to ask the question that we ask in any of these fandom videos, and that is, does it resonate, Karen, New Moon? Does it resonate with you as you are now? Mm, does it resonate with adult Karen 
No. Um, it resonates more than Twilight. I very much enjoyed it more yes. than Twilight. And um, and seeing Bella go through the falling in love and the breakup and the way that that emotionally is, like, I do think that that cycle, I can look at that and like seeing that complete cycle and being like, oh, yeah, I was there when I was Bella's age. I can understand that and I can feel that. Right. But um, I, I have a lot of trouble resonating with a fantasy book that does not care about its world building. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I, I do. I, yeah, I have a lot of trouble with that. I have a lot of trouble with that. Ah, oh, Koneko. Sorry. Well, it's too late because we're about to end this and we actually are going to go to to Final Fantasy X too. So it's okay. Um, oops, I forgot to change that. We had a lot of technical drama before the stream. So yeah, um, it, it doesn't it doesn't resonate with me. And I and I just I just don't I, I, I have I just have trouble. I have trouble with a fantasy book that clearly doesn't care about its fantasy elements. Um, I'm cool with romanticy. Okay. Like I like yeah. fantasy romances or, or romances with fantasy in them. I like that. But if there is going to be fantasy elements for me to resonate with that, I have to see some level of effort in the world building because otherwise I don't understand why there are fantasy elements. You know what I mean? Because fantasy elements exist for us to commentate on our own world in a fantastical way. So it's kind of like disconnected. So you can comment on it in a safer way. So like, why are there fantasy elements if you're not going to have commentary on anything? Um, I don't get it. Uh, so, so no, I have to say new moon, even though it's more than twilight is still not there for me. Still not there for me. Um, what about you, Landon? Does new moon resonate with you? resonates more than twilight uh i am in the era of my life where you know relating to a teenage love story is getting harder and harder by the day uh however i will say that this is the tm bella is sad book like mm -hmm. this is all about sad and if you don't know me I too am all about the sad <laughs> I enjoy 